Greetings and welcome to the Open Minded Skeptic Podcast. My name is Sharon Ann Rowland and I'm your host. On the 22nd of October in 2015, I had the pleasure and opportunity to interview Rex and Heather Gilroy, cryptozoologists located in the beautiful Blue Mountains of New South Wales. Um, I put together a few of the highlights from this interview and I hope that you will enjoy their insight into cryptozoology and relic hominology within Australia. For our readers, Rex and Heather, would you briefly explain what cryptozoology and relic hominology is and the kind of activities you might typically perform? Well, cryptozoology and relic hominology are two fields, uh, quite often uh, regarded close together by some, but cryptozoology uh, is the search for mystery animals or species unknown to science uh, or, or creatures that are thought to be extinct but, but, but might still be around. Wonderful. And with uh, relic hominology, uh, that's to do with, of course, uh, relic, prime, uh, relic hominins, that is, uh, human ancestors that are still with us, even primates, as in the case of the Yeti in the Himalayas, uh, or dweller among the rocks, as the word means. Interesting. And here in Australia, we have, of course, the Yowie or Hairy Man uh, in Aboriginal folklore. They were called hairy because they wore animal hide garments and uh, they also made stone tools and fire, which to me means that we're dealing with a, a form or forms of Homo erectus, our immediate ancestor. There's a giant form of about uh, 3.66 metres or 12 foot on the old scale and we have an average human size type. Uh, then we have the pygmy type, the little hairy people of the Aborigines, uh, particularly of northern Queensland, but we have them down here in the Blue Mountains too. Mm. And the fourth type is a hirsute creature uh, which actually really fits the uh, image of the hairy man, and of course there's hairy women too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you for not being sexist. This, <laughs> but in this case, we're dealing with living Australopithecines. Mm. And Australopithecines migrated out of Africa at some stage and reached Australia. I have proof of it here in that 2.5 million year old skull. The only one, the only evidence bone-wise found outside of Africa of Australopithecines to date. And this is the first skull found outside of Africa and I found it, which, which, which I'm still proud of because <coughs> it shows that Australia has more than just an Aboriginal history. Yes, it does. Yes. The Aborigines came here by <coughs> maybe 50 to 60,000 years ago Excuse me, <coughs> and we have evidence in way of footprints here at Katoomba and other parts of the uh, the Australian continent going back a million years or two million years in early Pleistocene um, fossil deposits. So when Australia was joined by a land shelf to Asia, it's quite likely that other races were able to walk in here and evolve and certainly Homo erectus came here and evolved into modern humans here in Australia before he did in Africa wow. and the earliest traces of modern humans go back at least four to five hundred thousand years in my fossil collection there are footprints that are older in, in rock uh, but certainly in Africa Homo sapiens evolved from Homo erectus only 150,000 years ago. In other words, Australia was the birthplace of modern humans. So I believe, yes, that's wonderful. The 
word Yowie, is that an Aboriginal word? Or? Yes. In fact, uh, there are other names written in different parts of the country in the different dialects. But in East Australia, principally uh, from northern New South Wales to southern New South Wales and inland into the central west around the Orange area, uh, early, uh, early researchers uh, found the name Yowie seemed to be the most commonplace uh, name and it means hairy man or hairy people. Hairy people. And so, as I say, they, they were hairy because they had animal hide garments, not because they were covered in hair. That's nice to know, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but we have this other creature uh, that uh, has joined the, the, the group lately, the Australopithecines, and they are hairy, and the Aborigines say that they were the earliest form of hairy man they knew. And so he's always been around. We have for example, just west of the Blue Mountains there, Kananga Boyd Wilderness, uh, volcanic ash and mud flows. And after one of these cooled, somebody walked across one three million years ago. Mm -hmm. They left about eight tracks. They stop after two or three, turn and look to one side or the other, and in doing so have left one, two, three tracks, and then they've continued on. Uh, across the, the field of volcanic ash and uh, disappeared into the side of an embankment. And who was it three million years ago in Australia to leave hominin footprints? It would have to be an Australopithecine. Uh, early Homo uh, <coughs> is evidence for them almost two million years in Africa, but we have the same here in Australia. And I think that Australia had a separate evolution, hominin, uh, evolution to that of Africa and this is what I'm putting out in my books. Yes, that's great. So Heather, you're obviously on all of these expeditions. What are the type of activities you would typically perform? Normally I'm just there to make sure Rex doesn't get into strife, oh. <laughs> as far as if he falls or something like I've that. Only been lost of once. late, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately I haven't been able to go into the bush as much as I would like because of my own physical... Um, when, when you were on the expeditions, were you... Um, I was there, I was in there. You yes. were with the little brush and brushing things away? Yes, mm -hmm. usually doing the photos of Rex doing things. <laughs> so um, you're, you're the official photographer? I'm the official there photographer, but although Rex does most of his own phot photography stuff now, wonderful. Yeah. But yeah, other than that, sort of I do the afterwork. Yeah. So, At 72, I have no intention of retiring. Wow. I'll be 72 in a couple of weeks. You're 72. When did this all start? You were 14, oh, I believe. When I was seven years old, oh, my seven. parents took me to the Australian Museum in Sydney and I was never the same again. It was a hot Sunday and I remember I found the insect collection. That started me. Oh. <laughs> my father was looking at a, a, an Asian woman over here and her husband, she had a dress right up to here. And, and he's fixated on her. I said, come on here, you. That was my father. And so I was just uh, wondering, how does she get around like that? <laughs> I said, yeah, why has she got a dress to her mummy? He says, oh, in, uh, in Hong Kong, they're up there, it's very hot. <laughs> <laughs> My old man was more interested. But you were supposed to be looking at the butterflies. But you were that. captured by the insects. That. But Is that I, right? at that <laughs> moment, at that moment when that was happening, mm -hmm. I saw this big reconstruction of a head of the giant monitor lizard Megalania and uh, I decided I'm going to look for fossils mm. when I'm older and uh, so I, the father ended up making me a glass case by 1956 when they saw I wouldn't give up insects. In fact they made me my first butterfly in it uh, and uh, an old natural up here in the mountains when we were coming up here on holidays on a regular basis. 
he uh, he taught me how to pin things out properly, how to keep uh, notes in the field and all that. Wow. And so basically, I taught myself mm -hmm. how to make setting boards for the insects and everything, how to preserve them and whatever. And so I built up thousands of insects from all over the world gradually. But it's not just a collection. I collected something because I wanted it. I might have a whole glass case full of cabbage butterflies, row upon row of male and female, top side, underside, mm -hmm. and then labels telling you that not one of those butterflies are alike. Mm -hmm. Because there's, in nature you'll find with insects, particularly butterflies or moths, you put, you put two males or two females side by side and you'll see the markings slightly larger on one than they are on the other. Mm -hmm. And so that led me into genetics of insects and... Your fascination with it. I yeah. even wanted to have a butterfly farm up here, but the local council said it was against town planning. And, and butterflies? Uh, so unusual. <laughs> So from yeah. that he then got but into... I've, uh, I've had to do my own research under difficult conditions all my life and so this is the in spite years. of that I learned everything in the bush. I didn't learn it out of a university textbook and I've had to keep notes even before I knew the name of insects when I was uh, even when I started high school, Liverpool High School, at the age of uh, 13 there I was drawing pictures and colouring them in and and uh, recording what I knew of the, the particular butterfly and bit by bit I found their names. I'm going to the Australian Museum collection and uh, getting the Latin names mm -hmm. and uh, finding out as much as I could. There were no books available on Australian insects we were waiting at the for time. You, it was all were, British. We were waiting for you to write them. Oh, well, that's it. They, yeah. they, they <laughs> finally started in the last 20 years putting things out. We still need a good book on Australian beetles. But my interests now have turned from amassing this huge collection uh, for science. I'm told because I have no degrees, my collection is scientifically worthless. Ridiculous. And what I am going to use my collection for now, the insects and spiders, for example, is for um, conservation purposes. I want to see, I'd like to see laws brought in to protect certain butterflies and moths. I want to see a lot of countries being wantonly bulldozed around Sydney preserved because they're destroying the habitats of species that no one can understand why they're becoming extinct. They haven't got their habitats. When I was growing up there were thousands of beetles and, and moths and everything hanging around our old farm at Lansvale. You go down there now, you're lucky to see a cabbage butterfly. And I want to see us do something about our heritage while we can. The Blue Mountains is pretty safe, but uh, it's too late for a lot of the species that were flying up here and laying their eggs. I don't know what's happened, but even the ones that were breeding up here uh, have taken a nosedive. We've got to do something about it. I don't know what it is, whether it's chemtrails or something, but. I am now more concerned with saving my heritage, saving my environment, than just forming collections. Even the collection, of the stone uh, images I have of the sun god Bell and other things I found around Australia that show people were coming here 3,000 years ago. Uh, this, to me, uh, is important. It shows that our history is far older than Captain Cook. Mm. Cook used a Portuguese map to find his way here anyway. Mm. Uh, yeah. It's unofficial, but he, he, he was given a copy of, a, of the Dauphin chart um, before he left England. And that's why when he was wrecked on the Barrier Reef and barely made it into Cooktown Harbour, he, he charted a course for Cooktown, a place he didn't know existed supposedly, yeah. and writes in his Logbook, the harbour was smaller than I had been led to believe. As uh, the American humorist Mark Twain said, the history of Australia reads like beautiful lies, but it's all true. Yeah. <laughs>
if I could draw you back to your, your your past the past twenty years of work that you've done, out of that those that those expeditions, what have been the most convincing piece of evidence you think you've found? In what field? Yes. The most, convincing, <laughs> the most convincing evidence uh, for the Yowie is the comparison between, say, this footprint and a set of fossil ones out there on Narendra. We have fossil tracks which are identical to these and which, uh, and this is a recent one of course, so well, the, uh, the foot structure hasn't uh, changed as far as we know, well, they're, they're out there. Did you go on expeditions straight away to Sydney? Well, uh, it was useless trying to chase him. Mm -hmm. But I had, yes, I led an expedition in 1984 um, when I got some people to help me uh, down into the, uh, the Gross Valley. But in more recent times, Heather and I have been uh, to Tasmania and four days before we had to leave, I found tracks at Rosebury mm -hmm. and I've got the casts at home. On the west coast of Texas. And just recently at Blackheath, uh, on a bush track, walking the dog, I found in the afternoon tracks that had been made earlier in the day and the next morning I came back and cast them and I had them at home. Uh, the, the creature's paw went in and the rest of the leg went down and that's a rarity. and it left an impression of that and I was able to get that uh, that part of the foot with the extra, um, Did you? what do you call it, corn that they oh, had there. The back. Yes. Uh, yeah, they okay. had that in a bit higher up, and uh, or a claw rather I should say, and that was embedded in the ground too. So I've been very lucky and it proves that they're still up here, mm -hmm. but that they're still in Tasmania and my fight now is to make people aware of the need to protect the old growth forests Definitely. and uh, um, the western tiers for example and if they allow the government or if the government allows timber people to tear them away there goes a habitat for the last remaining thylacines and also other creatures that rely on that habitat uh, yeah. for their own survival and uh, Oh, so I'm into conservation, uh, heavily in, in insect conservation. I want to see conservation of creatures that aren't officially proven yet. Mm -hmm. The Australian panther is a marsupial cat. We've Females have been seen carrying pouched young. And we have had multiple sightings in this area of that, haven't yes. we? Yes. yes. I mean, um, they've been on... I'm sure I've seen film on actual TV that people have taken on their phones. I was within six foot of one one night <laughs> down in Kangaroo Valley on a rainy night. So I don't think we can it call that mythical. Looked at that me. Is, <laughs> yeah. I, I retreat, made a strategic withdrawal to the gate here in case my theories were wrong and that they do attack. <laughs> but it went the well, other direction. <laughs> um, they only attack. Well, they wouldn't attack. They'd defend themselves. The Blue Mountains Lion. I would run if I saw that. Now, that is a sketch I did in 1980. Wow, look at the teeth. That is teeth uh, at the front. And uh, that was based on people's descriptions. i have been vindicated up at Riversley. Scientists have in the last couple of years found fragments of bones of a creature uh, smaller than that, that one there, but still with the sabre tooth and everything. The, the, the giant monitor lizard, Megalonia priscarowan, uh, supposedly extinct several thousand years. Uh, that one has um, has a lot of the scientists uh, saying that oh, it's extinct. You know, people have just seen oversized uh, monitors, and they can grow up to about ten foot with the tail. The tail is very thin uh, and uh, comes to a minuscule point perfect specimen so that would add to the length but this fellow 30 foot and 3,000 pounds weight well uh, wow. <laughs> and maybe even if they're 20 25 uh, foot in length on the old scale the whale size, what's that, that in metric but anyway they are out there 
we have tracks. The one I have there, um, that I think you photographed earlier, it, uh, it actually shows a creature of about, oh, 20 foot in length, and it walked across a farmer's uh, recently ploughed field he, uh, at Maruya, and he rang me, this was about May 1979, rang me about it and uh, we couldn't get down for a couple of days. And I said, uh, cover them with something to uh, in case it rains, yes. and I'll come down and cast them. So we put a big old-fashioned washing, tin washing tub over one mm -hmm. and lumps of grass over the rest. And it came pouring down and the ones under the grass just got uh, ruined. They were still there when I got there, but they showed hardly any decent features. But the other one was perfect, and I made a cast of that. So they're out there. Yes. Uh, down in Victoria, Omeo in 1895, uh, one of these creatures appeared out of nowhere, uh, probably from the, the Alps somewhere, crossed through the bushland that was still pretty thick then, and. Uh, terrorised the whole town for a couple of weeks. It was seen on various farms. It uh, fed on the local poultry and, uh, and a calf or two and uh, a whole army of settlers banded together with guns and dogs and they went looking for it but it had retreated back into the bush. So uh, that's the last major, um, sighting, major sighting of that kind uh, since then. That these animals have retreated as their habitat's been Has developed <laughs> further and further back. Yeah. This is the last retreat, the eastern mountain ranges. And this country here that developers thankfully uh, will not get into, and we're a national park. But I, I know that there's, there's reasonable populations of a lot of these creatures. My method is to get in there one day, look for evidence and get out. If you stay around, if you camp out, uh, creatures tend to leave. Uh, they'll, they'll think you're going to be there permanently, so they leave. It's and better, we're going in small groups. Yeah, going Not two, three expeditions. people is my limit because uh, big groups make too much noise, whether it's a yowl or a fire scene or whatever. They'll hear you coming for miles. Smell you too, probably. And the, these expeditions looking for the yowie with four-wheel drives and <laughs> television people in tow that certain people I know have been guilty of, uh, they accomplish nothing because everything within miles, every bird, every creature will be gone because of the noise they make. And so you've got to be quiet in the bush. Even creatures are quiet in the bush. You've got to be if you're going to survive, so uh, if you're a, a creature. <laughs>